Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. This week, when we invest in women, they invest back in their families, they invest in their communities, and they invest they invest in their countries. And in many of these countries, they represent 50% of the population. You cannot uh, ignore 50% of your population and think that your country is going to grow. I'll bring you my conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, at the U.S. Africa Business Summit. We'll hear her message about what is at stake for Africa's women as countries try to cope and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, booster shots in Africa right now is like a hard man asking for a second serving of dessert while the chef announces the unavailability of food even for the head of the home. I'll speak one-on-one -on -one with the World Health Organization's vaccine expert Fiona Atuebwe about booster shots in wealthier countries and vaccine inequity in Africa and elsewhere. She tells me how her personal COVID-19 battle drives home the urgency of getting more shots in arms across Africa. Straight Talk Africa starts now. The United States is the global leader in vaccine donations, pledging to send 1.1 billion doses to help the world fight the COVID-19 pandemic. But so far, it has shipped only 15% of the doses it has promised. Will America's latest pledge be enough to make up for the global vaccine shortfall? VOA's White House Bureau Chief Patsy Widakuswara has the story. For every shot given domestically, the United States will send three shots abroad. That's the pledge President Joe Biden made to help vaccinate the world. The United States is buying another half billion doses of Pfizer to donate to low and middle income countries around the world. This is another half billion doses that will all be shipped by this time next year. And it brings our total commitment to have donation of donated vaccines to over 1.1 billion vaccines to be donated. Of the 1.1 billion doses the U.S. has promised, the State Department said about 172 million have been shipped, or about 15 percent. The White House said 200 million more doses will go out by the end of 2021, and the remaining 800 million will be sent out by September 2022. The claim about being the arsenal of vaccines for the world think is a great talking point. It would be great to see put into action, uh, but that can't just be about donation pledges. So I do think when we talk about access and supply of vaccines, we have to look at the overall picture of who's actually getting access. Humanitarian organizations say 80% of administered doses have gone to rich countries and less than 1% to low-income countries. Data from analytics company Airfinity on vaccine stock in the U.S., European Union, United Kingdom, Canada, and China, countries with the biggest surplus, show an excess of 670 million doses by the end of September, even after those countries offered booster shots to everyone older than 12. You now have a situation where you have rich countries that have three times as many doses as they actually need. And there's a real risk there that one, it's leaving out much of the world, and two, we may not be able to use that whole supply. We're already seeing rich countries essentially waste millions and millions of doses because they expire before they can be used. Advocates say the U.S. should be ramping up shipments of donations now and do more to transfer vaccine technology. President Biden could use his powers to force companies like Pfizer and Moderna to share their technology and know-how with, um, with the global platforms that have been created to do that. The World Health Organization has created an mRNA technology transfer hub uh, in South Africa, uh, Pfizer and Moderna have not participated, they have not offered up their technology to those hubs. Airfinity data show vaccine manufacturers produce 1.5 billion doses per month. With more than 6 billion doses already administered globally, the WHO goal of getting the remaining 5 billion doses required to vaccinate the world's population could be achieved in months as long as wealthy nations can loosen their grip on global supply. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. 
Africa has the ability and expertise to develop and manufacture COVID-19 vaccines on its soil, but individual countries must unite and show they have the will to do it. That's according to Fiona Atuhebwe, a new vaccines introduction medical officer at the World Health Organization. She says wealthier countries must also be willing to share their intellectual property and resources to boost vaccine manufacturing in Africa. Atuhebwe is vocal about getting more shots in arms on the continent, and for good reason. In April this year, she contracted the coronavirus. Speaking to me from the Ugandan capital of Kampala recently, Atuhebwe describes how that experience changed the way she thinks and talks to people about the dangers of COVID-19 and the safety of the vaccines. Um, we got COVID at my workplace. I was the youngest and the most active and the healthiest of all of us who got COVID. But I was the person that ended up in ICU. COVID can manifest in a very severe and critical way to anybody at any age. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are. It's, you can actually suffer the, and die the consequences. I was more worried about my family than I was about myself because they were away from me and, and I knew that Ugandans were not taking COVID very seriously. And the stigma that Ugandans were putting on people who had traveled and all that was what I was protecting them from. My husband, my children, and my mother. And my family had to go through the process with me for me to get back on my feet. Fiona, can you share with us how that experience, going from public health professional to patient, influence the way you see, the way you talk and think about this virus today? Really getting affected with the virus was a big turning point in my life. At the beginning and all throughout my life, I've been selfless in my work and have always given everything that I have, service above self. I was working full time, oblivious of the fact that I could fall victim of the virus. When I got infected, I really reflected deeply about some personal things like my family and what I would want to be remembered for as an individual. It was indeed a terrifying moment for me uh, because, yes, I don't live with my family. And again, I've managed people in ICU, but I'd never been somebody as a patient in ICU. So it was also at the point where the symptoms were not well understood and the prognosis was not clear. The only proven information was that it was less fatal for young people like me at the time in my age category and those without comorbidities. So I was given very good care by WHO, but after the sickness, it took much longer to get back to my feet. I went through many symptoms and after effects, uh, as, such as motions, depressions, and inability to, to function normally. So I was out of work for about four months and this period really changed my life. There are changes that became the centerpiece of my life. So one, for example, I learned that COVID is real and it can be fatal. And the number of people dying have an impact on families and the people they leave behind. Previously for me, it was just statistics, number of cases, waves, and number of deaths. It's just statistics until it becomes personal. So I learned that I should therefore devote my life to save lives through dissemination of the right information and policy guidance, of course, because I work for WHO, uh, to countries and to the public. Also, having gone through it, I know that COVID-19 is beyond lungs and the failure to breathe. I almost lost my kidneys and my mental health went down the drain. So for me, I look at the virus with a completely different lens. I also learned that I should dedicate more time to things that matter, to family, to work and serving community, which is something I've dedicated my life to. And also should be able to explain the COVID-19 effects in simple and personal terms for it to be understood. Without loved ones, I don't know, that disease would have gone with me. This disease is characterized by solitude, only that when we as scientists sit at the table, we look at it in terms of numbers, in terms of oxygen supply and all that, but at indiv in public health, we look at it generally as South Africa has been affected in a major way. The health system is giving way. But at individual level, it's something completely, completely different. The absence of a mother or a father in a family is something that is really, really major. So I also learned that the val to value my time on this app, time is not really as infinite as we think. 
And I would like to make a significant contribution to humanity to contribute towards changes in attitudes uh, towards healthcare. Of course, the healthy lifestyle and everything that we live, but personal happiness and that joy and and what uh, when all is said and done, I intend to continue living a purposeful life and leave behind a rich legacy. And all this came through my experience with COVID, because you get that time alone to learn uh, to think through yourself, your life. When you see yourself at the verge of death, you have all the time to think about the things you never have had time to think about. Fiona, as families, communities and countries battle to cope with the spread of COVID-19, it's often hard to get a real big picture view of, uh, you know, just how bad the spread of COVID-19 is uh, across Africa. We remember in the beginning, um, there was this debate around whether the, the number of cases might not be as high on the African continent. Can you please give us a bird's eye view of the spread of COVID-19 across Africa right now? How many lives has this virus claimed and which countries face the greatest challenges in terms of the spread of the virus and their vaccination efforts? So in Africa, there are now more than 8.3 million cases with about 213,000 deaths, uh, which gives us a case fatality rate of 2.5%. Uh, that means 2.5% of the people who get COVID-19 will die. More than 7.7 .7 million people have recovered, which also gives us about 93% uh, of the confirmed cases having recovered. Currently, we have 16 countries in resurgence. We have Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burundi, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Ethiopia, Gabon, Ghana, Mauritius, Rwanda, Sao Tome and Principe, Somalia and Togo. These countries change. Every week, these countries change. Countries are in and out of waves. In the past week, five countries accounted for 50% of all new cases. South Africa, Morocco, Ethiopia, uh, Libya. While there, there has been a marked improvement in procurement and uptake of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, in Africa since mid-August, we still have major concerns. But for now, when we get these resurgences in countries, the issue in Africa is not just the numbers. It is the fragility of our health systems. We cannot handle as many cases as Europe or the US can handle. Even if it's just 20 cases, this can crush the health system of just a single African country. 20 cases that require ICU. We don't have that oxygen capacity that other countries have, even PPE for healthcare workers. So the numbers may look small, the case fatality may look uh, low, but actually the case fatality is high uh, in, on the African continent. But we do have fragile health systems. We can't handle those huge numbers. Of course, anyone who has grown up in an African country will know that, you know, we're vaccinated from a very early age. Um, it's just a part of life. Uh, in a recent World Health Organization video on social media, Fiona, you called for ramped up efforts to help reach the target of vaccinating 30% of Africans by the end of 2021 in that video. Uh, from what you are seeing um, around the pace of immunization drives right now, do you think that goal is attainable? And what would having 30% of Africans vaccinated mean for the fight against the spread of COVID-19 on the continent? So actually, uh, the target has since been revised to 40%. And that even makes it worse. And we are still a long way off. The pace of immunization in Africa is directly proportional to the number of vaccines coming to our continent. And availability of supplies is the biggest challenge to the rollout. It's not that Africa cannot roll out vaccines. We've had thousands of polio campaigns. We've had measles campaigns, yellow fever campaigns. Vaccination is not our problem. Right now, our problem is availability of vaccine. So there have been 15 countries that have achieved the 10%. We had a 10% target by end of September. And the one commonality between these 15 countries that managed to meet that target is the access to steady vaccine supply. All of them have administered more than 25 uh, doses per 100 people, but most have also had resources to procure vaccines or strike bilateral deals, which not every African country can do outside the COVAX facility. 
So in terms of donor dollars, we've seen significant goodwill from wealthier countries uh, in response to WHO's calls for them to share. But the delivery and commitment have to be significantly accelerated if we have to, any, to have any hope of achieving uh, this 40% target. To date, high-income countries have promised to donate more than 1 billion doses, but less than 15% of these doses have materialized. So as we raise the percentage of vaccinated people across countries, the likelihood of African countries experiencing severe fourth or subsequent waves decreases because this is directly related to the proportion of people vaccinated at community and national level. This then preserves what I already mentioned, our fragile health facilities, our health systems and economies. We really still can't handle. However low the numbers would be, we can't handle them. So, and of course, if we do vaccinate more, it reduces the likelihood of further mutations, which has consequences globally. But without adequate vaccine uh, coverage in Africa, no other countries will be safe. And this 40% target is really directly tied to the supplies. We have the ability to vaccinate. Africa simply needs extra vaccine. And of course, Fiona, there has been a lot of debate and controversy around the issue of vaccine inequity. And the fact that booster shots are being offered in wealthier Western nations when countries in Africa are battling to get even that first dose into people's arms. And now, in addition, we're seeing new research by Pfizer-BioNTech showing that COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness drops after six months. Do you think wealthier countries have a case to make here to administer booster shots to their populations? And if it's been this challenging getting first doses into arms across Africa, what do you expect it will be like getting booster shots to people on the continent? WHO's primary opposition to generalized booster shots outside the scientifically proven groups at this particular point in time is for equity purposes. And of course, the practice will negatively impact donor countries' capacity to donate vaccines, which is currently Africa's lifeline. Effectively, then, every additional jab in the arm of someone who is fully vaccinated is a job taken away from a healthcare worker, an elderly person, or someone with a comorbidity who has not received the first dose in Africa. While a large percentage of, uh, of the world's people are still waiting for their first dose, it is really unethical for all high-income countries to consider or move to general application of booster shots. Booster shots in Africa right now is like a herdsman asking for a second serving of dessert while the chef announces the unavailability of food even for the head of the home. So booster shots in Africa will be out of question for now. But really, we implore the higher income countries to hold on to the, to hold on to the booster shots for the general population as poorer countries at least get their most vulnerable populations at least with a single dose. Fiona, are you concerned that the new research by Pfizer-BioNTech about vaccine efficacy dropping uh, might feed into the vaccine misinformation that we're already seeing? And, you know, people's fears and mistrust um, of this vaccine's safety and efficacy. So imagine data shows that immunocompromised people should receive a third dose uh, that if they did not respond sufficiently to the initial doses or if they are no longer producing antibodies. The WHO position remains that third doses should be prioritized for only those at most at risk populations when there's evidence that such waning immunity against severe disease and death has happened. But they're not for the fit and healthy like you and me, really, while poorer countries have no doses. And now coming to your question. So on the African continent currently, our reality is that demand for vaccines is clearly outstripping supply. That's surprising because we have seen extra waves. The first wave did not hit us that bad, but extra waves have. And while vaccine safety fears uh, with this uh, Pfizer announcement and research, the safety fears and misinformation are certainly factors uh, in vaccine hesitancy. Our tracking shows us that the situation on vaccine hesitancy is improving in Africa. We are acutely aware of the need for continued advocacy efforts in this regard, but we still need those vaccines. That, that information does not change anything for anybody who has not had a single dose. 
and we're seeing the debate around vaccine inequity has also brought into the spotlight the fact that Africa has traditionally imported 99% of the vaccines that it administers and produced only 1%. I'm not sure if people have always known this. Uh, why has this been the case and what has been standing in the way of Africa's ability to ramp up vaccine development and production on home soil? Good question. Africa has proven it can actually manufacture vaccines. Senegal has been manufacturing yellow fever vaccines since 2009, and that's the 1% you're talking about. It's really political will and leadership. In 2016, at the African Union Summit, uh, the health ministers all endorsed the African uh, the, the Addis Declaration on Immunization, of which one of which commitments was to commit to uh, uh, ramping up the research and development in their countries. In 2017, heads of state did endorse the same declaration. But it has taken the onset of COVID-19 to really accelerate the political will, uh, which significantly has been accelerated because now we have seen that without local manufacturing, it's impossible. So generally, it has been the political will. The funding that is associated with vaccine manufacture is so high. It can be sourced on the African continent. Our problem is not the human resources. We have well-educated scientists who can do research and all that. It's just countries coming together to agree to, to prioritize vaccine manufacturing, and it can be done. Fiona, how soon do you expect we'll see COVID-19 vaccines developed and produced in Africa? And which African countries, in your view, are best positioned to make this happen. You mentioned Senegal, but it can't just be Senegal, right? We're going to have to have more countries on this. So Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal still, Nigeria and South Africa have, have between one and three manufacturers each. Some have the capacity for fill and finish and others for drug substance manufacturing too. Egypt, for example, is in the process of building a vaccine facility that will be able to procure, to produce one billion Sinovac doses annually. They are expected to start production next month. That is excellent for our continent. South Africa's uh, Aspen facility has already produced millions of doses of Johnson & Johnson and will, uh, and will fill and finish uh, the, the 500, we expect 500 million uh, doses of Johnson & Johnson by the end of 2022. And on 21st June this year, WHO and its COVAX partners announced that they are working to establish the first COVID uh, 19M, the messenger RNA uh, vaccine technology transfer hub in South Africa. This will facilitate a broad rapid transfer of technology and enable the technology to be established at an industrial scale and clinical development uh, performed. But we need wealthier countries to commit to sharing their resources and intellectual property rights so the sector can continue growing on the continent. So, Fiona, before we go, I want to gauge your optimism levels. Are you optimistic that wealthier nations will heed this call for vaccine equity and that African countries will collectively hit that 40% vaccination target um, by the end of 2021? We are optimistic on the COVID-19 vaccines and that commitment to, have a, to get Africa to the 40% if wealthier countries just decide to hold on to the booster shots first and donate extra doses to Africa or allow African countries to buy extra doses, the, the doses that we need that the wealthier countries have hoarded and already booked and procured from the manufacturers. Well, at the World Health Assembly, a resolution and a firm commitment from the G20 and others was made for the local production of vaccines in Africa. How soon that will happen with wealthier countries releasing their intellectual property rights a lot of discussion has been going on. Uh, it's been one year now. This has not materialized. We can only keep hoping and that things will get better. At the end of the day, we are at the mercy of those with the vaccine doses. And that was Fiona Atuweb, where new vaccines introduction medical officer at the World Health Organization, speaking to me from Kampala, Uganda. Now, we conducted a poll on social media and asked whether you would get the COVID-19 vaccine for you and your family. Let's look at some of the results. 65% of you said yes and 35% said no. And we also asked what you think about the idea of a COVID-19 vaccine developed and manufactured 
in Africa. And I'm going to pull up some of the answers that we received on social media. And let's kick things off here with Kambugu Yusuf in Uganda, who says Africa has the ability and capacity to do so, but the leaders in Africa are not willing. Leadership in Africa is the major problem because our leaders are minoring in the majors and majoring in the minors. That was fun to say. The one important thing that I admire about the West is the leadership and willingness of everyone that is entrusted with authority to put their country and common interests before their own. And Venetius Jr. also in Uganda says African leaders only have the capacity to steal from their countries, not focus on science. They only specialize in regime protection. Another comment from Uganda, this time from Kaira Simon Peter, who says Africa is too focused on politics and not on science. Yet we are realizing that science is a core part of Africa's future. We can manufacture our own vaccines, but we have been fed on the breast of neo-colonialism. Zondi Milanzi believes manufacturing the vaccine would give Africa more advantages. However, developing a vaccine might take longer. We need urgent medical solutions to handle the pandemic. Getting the license to locally produce already available vaccines might be a good start. Kofi Kofi in Ghana has this sobering comment. He says, we sat here for centuries watching malaria take the lives of millions of Africans, especially babies. We live business as usual, waiting for others to find the vaccine and secure our very existence. Do you think African leaders and scientists would urgently look for a vaccine to fight a virus that has killed fewer people than malaria has? And finally, a comment from Carolyn Atieno in Uganda, who says, yeah, it will feel safer with our own product. The only bad thing is that our rulers in Africa only care about their positions, the next election, and buying guns to keep themselves in power. Thank you so much for sharing your comments with us on social media. You keep posting them and I'll keep reading them. Still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, my conversation with the US ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and why she says women should be central to every country's pandemic recovery plans. Stay with us. watching Straight Talk Africa on VOA. Welcome back. Every year, the Corporate Council on Africa here in Washington brings together heads of state and leaders in government and business from across Africa and the United States to talk about their relationship as well as new business and investment opportunities on the two continents. This year, the effort between the US and African countries to fight COVID-19 was high on the agenda, as well as the digital transformation era, manufacturing and the future of US-Africa trade. Here's an excerpt from the 13th U.S. Africa Business Summit, which was held virtually in July. The Corporate Council on Africa has been the voice of private sector engagement between the United States and Africa for a quarter century. This relationship provides us with a foundation upon which both parties can build a stronger U.S.-Africa economic partnership.
I therefore believe that the theme of the summit, new pathways to a stronger US-Africa economic partnership under a new Biden administration is befitting. Our global trading partners support this project will set the tone of relationships with Africa for years ahead. There is a strong appetite to do more business in Africa, to bring more capital to Africa, and as I said, now to strengthen our partnership and collaboration. The president has requested $80 million in additional funding to jumpstart the Prosper Africa Build Together campaign a newly reimagined Prosper Africa initiative that will drive billions of dollars of investment in Africa, build new markets for American products, and create thousands of jobs for both African and American workers. And as you can see from that video, I was part of the event this year. I was invited by the Corporate Council on Africa to be a moderator at the US-Africa Business Summit. And that's where I had the chance to have a conversation with the US Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Now, Greenfield is a staunch advocate for the rights of women and girls and has decades of US-Africa foreign policy experience. We discussed the relationship between the United States and African nations and why countries on the continent should put women at the centre of their pandemic recovery efforts. Madam Ambassador, speaking on Africa Day earlier this year, you acknowledged that Africa has many challenges. COVID-19, of course, uh, poverty, terrorism, amongst many others. But you also said that the Biden administration understands that it needs to focus on the opportunities on the continent and not just the challenges. What are the greatest opportunities that the United States sees on the African continent today? Well, thank you for that question. And let me start by saying before COVID-19 hit, Africa, uh, African economies were some of the fastest growing economies in the world. And somewhere between six out of 10 of the top fastest growing country, uh, countries were on the continent of Africa. I see many opportunities for these countries now to build back better, as we have said here in the United States. And they can build back better with more equitable uh, growth, with more diversity, with more market-based uh, transparent practices, and with a focus on climate smart uh, futures. And also, I have to add, with a focus on equity for uh, for women who have been key players in in the market on the uh, in the marketplace on the continent of Africa, so let me start with climate change. Uh, climate change is it's it's a challenge for all of us all over the globe, but it also presents a tremendous opportunity to create well-paying jobs on the continent of Africa as the world transitions to renewable energies and develop transformational technologies that can help countries reduce uh, emissions and also adapt to uh, climate change. We're committed to making sure, for example, that developing countries can build back greener through public climate financing. Africa with a population of 1.3 billion people with a medium age of 19, 19. Uh, uh, Africa's youth are probably one of its greatest resources. There's a tendency to see youth, uh, for example, as a problem. But for the continent of Africa, youth are an opportunity, and they are an opportunity that the uh, continent needs to take advantage of. This new generation has a different outlook. Uh, they have a, a different approach to uh, 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 to how they want to uh, see their leadership. And we have an opportunity to uh, mentor and support these young people as we're doing through the Africa, the Young African Leaders Initiative, so that we can help them prepare uh, for uh, for futures in government. And then I will add we uh, participation of women. Women have been uh, more than uh, most uh, victimized by 
COVID, but they also play a key role in how countries develop. And we have to make sure as countries are building back better, that they incorporate the women's uh, perspective in, in their efforts. Madam Ambassador, many African nations are currently experiencing their worst surge in COVID-19 cases and deaths uh, since this pandemic began, and it's all largely driven by the Delta variant. What are the most worrying pandemic trends that you are seeing on the continent right now? And what is your assessment of the way African governments have responded to this twin health and economic crises? You know, it uh, uh, this pandemic has really had a, a, a devastating uh, impact on, uh, on the economies of African countries. And as we reflect back on uh, the last 18 months, I have to say that many of the actions that were taken by African leaders to confront COVID-19 early on have saved countless lives. Many of these countries uh, uh, shut down uh, many of them had already had experiences dealing with uh, uh, pandemic-like conditions when some of them had to deal with Ebola. I will tell you that I was in Liberia in March of, of uh, 2020 as the, the impact of, of the pandemic began to take hold. And when I arrived in Liberia on March 2nd, they were already at the airport taking temperatures and uh, 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 with hand sanitizer. Uh, and that's before we actually realized what we were going to have to deal with uh, uh, a few weeks later. Uh, Liberia was already prepared. And so many countries made some early decisions that I think helped them deal with the early stages of the pandemic. But the situation uh, continued to get worse, and particularly as African countries were not able to access uh, the COVID vaccines uh, once these vaccines came on board and they were not prepared, for example, with the challenges to their very weak healthcare uh, systems. Uh, the, the countries began to, uh, to falter and with this new Delta variant out there, uh, I think the situation is going to get uh, even, even worse. Uh, you may know President Biden has uh, just announced and pledged that the United States uh, will be the world's arsenal of, of vaccines. I, I love that uh, phrase. And we're working as fast as we can to get shots in arms, not just here in the United States, but through COVAX to get as many vaccines out to the continent of Africa as, as possible, as well as through bilateral uh, donations of vaccines. And so we see that we're not just fighting the disease, we're fighting to secure decades of development progress that the pandemic uh, could, could unwind. So it's important that we get these vaccines out as quickly uh, as possible. Given the opportunities for the US on the African continent and beyond the COVAX commitments, what is America willing to do to ensure that Africa is not left behind as economies all over the world try to recover? Well, uh, it's clear what we are prepared to do, and we're doing it uh, through our actions, and that is getting the COVID vaccine out uh, to the continent of Africa so we can start putting those vaccines in, in arms. But we're also working with countries to help them build back their economies better. We have tremendous programs that work with uh, young people that are working with women, that are working uh, with uh, with finance ministries uh, to support their development uh, agendas through uh, not just USAID, but also through DFC, through our engagements with the World Bank and the IMF to ensure that these countries get the injections into their economy, uh, economies that they need to start to jumpstart these economies uh, to start to build their their countries back and develop and to develop a future for uh, for their for their people. International institutions and civil society organizations are sounding the alarm that all the hard won progress on gender equality and women's empowerment is now at risk of being eviscerated. Can you help us understand what is at risk for women right now, especially those on the African continent? And do you think? 
that any setbacks that we encounter now can be overcome in our lifetime? Well, let, let me start with the last question first. Those setbacks have to be, they, they cannot be, be lasting. We have to do everything possible to ensure that whatever experiences uh, women have right now in Africa, that we find a way to turn those around. There's a lot at risk, but it's not just for women and girls, it's for uh, their entire families, because we know that when women are empowered, they empower their families, they empower their communities, they empower their, their countries. And so we have to work with these countries to ensure that the pandemic and, and the alarming numbers that uh, of women worldwide who have been forced to choose between their jobs and, uh, and, and their family and their health and their businesses, that they have adequate uh, support. Uh, to uh, to move forward, but what we've seen and and uh, and I think what has been so devastating is uh, the impact. Early on, I saw statistics that indicated that child marriages are going up, that uh, the rape of girls in school, uh, sexual exploitation of girls in school because they're not in school, school age girls. Uh, because they're not in school, that those numbers have gone up significantly, uh, that um, uh, people are taking uh, advantage of, of women and girls in, in these circumstances. So we have to focus a tremendous amount of our attention on what, uh, on the impact that the pandemic has had on, on, on women and girls. We've seen that COVID-19 does seem to be reversing decades of, of, of hard-won uh, gains for girls, including access to, to education. I saw a UNICEF uh, uh, exhibition at the United Nations where they showed uh, uh, the exhibition had chairs with backpacks, the millions of, of children who are out of school and a significant number, more than 50% are, are, are girls. And so that is something that we have to work uh, to address to not only get vaccines out, but to get girls uh, back, into the, back into the classroom. Uh, the United States uh, knows that peace uh, programs uh, are being impacted uh, because girls, uh, women in, in civil society expand the scope of negotiations and now they're not being uh, included. Uh, in some of those uh, uh, negotiations. And we have to make sure that they are brought back to the table and that they are incorporated in any programs that uh, we are doing across the continent of Africa. Yes, indeed, um, Madam Ambassador, they, uh, the safety of women and education of girls, probably among the most heartbreaking consequences um, and heartbreaking group, heartbreaking stories of the groups that have been affected by this pandemic. The United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on women says across the globe, women earn less, they save less, they hold less secure jobs and are more likely to be employed in the informal sector. And in some African countries, there are no fiscal relief packages or social safety nets like we see in the United States and in other countries in the West or, or any other sort of benefits to help mitigate this devastating uh, impacts of this pandemic on women's lives and their livelihoods. In your view, what do African governments stand to gain by including women in their economic recovery strategies? And what do they stand to lose, madam, if they don't? Well, we know what they lose if they don't, because we've seen what they have lost because they haven't. Uh, and I think countries are now, leaders are, are, are now more conscious of the importance of having women engage in their country's development plan. Uh, because again, and I say this over and over and over again, when we invest in women, they invest back in their families, they invest in their communities, and they invest, they invest in their countries. And in many of these countries, they represent 50% of the population. You cannot uh, ignore 50% of your population and think that your country is going to grow. So these countries are losing significantly 
uh, if they don't include women in their development plans, they don't include women in, in, in their investment uh, efforts. Uh, they're losing out on what these women might uh, might contribute to, to their countries. We've seen all across the continent of Africa, successful women run businesses. Uh, and uh, we see the success that women have had in building their communities through civil society uh, activity. Uh, but we've also seen that they've been impacted by uh, the virus uh, much more significantly than other parts of the population. And we need to, for that reason, make sure we give them more attention than we might have otherwise given women as we start to build these economies back. Um, you know, Madam Ambassador, I'm sure you'll agree that if one thing COVID-19 has left us with many, many, many lessons um, for the future, you're a, lo a long time champion of gender equality. This is part of your life's work, focusing on the rights of women and girls. There's a generation in Africa of well-educated but unemployed youth. Uh, they're struggling through unprecedented and uncertain times. They've been called the pandemic generation. What immediate investments can governments, business, and, and the international community at large make in Africa's youth, especially its girls? Uh, what kind of investments can be made today that will prepare them and build resilience for whatever crisis might come next? You know, when you consider the fact that the median age on the continent of Africa is 19, we started with that. And then you have countries like Niger, where the medium age is 15. If we don't focus on young people, we're ignoring uh, a country. Half of the population under the age of 19. So it was for that reason, I am most proud of the work that I did and the Obama administration uh, did on supporting young people across the continent of Africa. The Young African Leaders Initiative will be paying dividends on the continent of Africa long after uh, I'm uh, gone from here. And it is something that we all have to make sure that we continue to invest in. Invest in mentoring young people, encouraging young people, supporting the leadership of young people in government, in business, in civil society, uh, in education. Uh, if we don't support this younger generation, uh, there will be nothing left of, of, of our future. They are uh, our future. And because of what I've seen in the thousands of young people that we've supported over the course. I think we started this program in 2010. I was ambassador in Liberia when we sent our first little small cohort of I think three Yali uh, leaders to the United States to meet with President Obama. And then seeing where those three are right now. And we've sent more across the continent every year, uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 young people coming to the United States just for a few weeks. And it's a life changer for them because they get to see their power. They get to see uh, what they can do with, uh, with their skills. And they get to go back to their countries and make a difference. And we're not trying to make them presidents. Initially, African leaders were like, I'm the leader. I don't need you to tell me who's going to be our next leader. We're not trying to make presidents, although I know I can't wait until I see the first Yali who becomes president of a country in, in Africa. So there's one out there, I know, but we want them to be leaders in their community. We want them to be leaders uh, in their businesses. We want them to be leaders in their churches, in their schools, and they will start building the next generation of leaders on the continent. And that's where Africa's future is. And that's what gives me total confidence and faith in, in Africa for the future. As long as we continue to support young people and encourage activities that build their, their leadership skills, this continent, uh, we haven't seen uh, what Africa uh, has uh, to give to the world uh, until we see what these young people are, are able to do. 
Um, Youngles are always told if you can um, see it, you can be it. And I love what you said. Um, we want them to see their power. Um, great thoughts, great insights, great ideas. Um, Madam Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Thank you so much for your time um, and for being here with me. I really, really do appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And again, I know Africa's future is bright because I know that there are so many young people out there who are building that future one brick at a time, and we're going to see the results of their work uh, in the future. Linda Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, speaking to me at the U.S. Africa Business Summit. It is time now to take a short break. And when we come back, it's said to be a game changer in the fight against COVID-19. But how does it work and how will it affect people's desire to get vaccinated? We'll explain it all after the break. medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back. Did you know there is a new weapon against COVID-19 and it comes in the form of a capsule? VOA's Carolyn Prasuti explains how it is a breakthrough and why other pills have been discovered that we haven't heard about. A stark illustration of the new number of COVID deaths in the United States, 700,000 from the White House. That is a striking, horrifying number of lives lost. But now, new hope. A pill that drug company Merck says prevents the coronavirus from multiplying. So promising that the clinical trials were stopped early, so more lives could be saved. Taken at the onset of the disease, the pill reduces the risk of hospitalization or death by half. They could go to their pharmacy and take their medication the way they do other medicines. This would allow us to treat many more people much more quickly and we trust much less expensively. Dr. Caleb Hernandez is an emergency room doctor who also researches COVID drug discoveries. He says three other pills have been introduced, one that reduces the need for oxygen by threefold, but not under big pharmaceutical names. So they sit on a shelf without the money for FDA approval. Our government is it set up to spend the $500,000 to do these studies. We rely on private companies to bring things to the FDA. And that's why you're, you're not gonna see as much innovation as you could see. Experts worry that Americans will rely more on this new pill and avoid vaccines that teach the body to make its own coronavirus antibodies. But for remote countries, pills may be easier to administer. Affordability and distribution are other factors, though. Hernandez hopes that some drug, any drug, will end the pandemic. He sings this tribute to a fellow doctor who quit the profession because he was burned out from COVID. We've been going for almost two years now, fighting every day and watching people die. And I, and I think it's difficult when people in the community don't believe you. They think that you're part of some conspiracy or you're 
exaggerating and making things up. And then you go to, to work and you have to pronounce multiple people dead. Merck plans to seek approval for emergency use of the drug, which could take about two months. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. And finally this week, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to hunger and food crises on nearly every continent in the world. South Africa alone has seen hunger increase nearly threefold, according to a national survey. One man is helping to tackle the problem by launching community farms to help feed inner city residents. Between flower beds, along roadsides, and on school fields, crops are springing up around South Africa's largest city. The idea of these so-called edible streets was spearheaded by Simbonga Nkanda Mandla and the non-profit Makers Valley Partnership to curb hunger and malnutrition. The need became ever more apparent as gardens were picked bare when lockdowns hit last year. You could see that like, uh, this household like, having had uh, a meal uh, in the past two days or so, and then uh, definitely then like uh, uh, others will open up uh, their fridge, refrigerator for you or others will open up their cupboard. You could see that like, there's literally nothing. South Africa is a major producer and exporter of fresh food, but many in the country aren't able to fill their plates. A national survey led by South Africa's Research Council found that as many as 22 percent of the country's 60 million people experienced hunger since the pandemic struck. That's compared to just 6 percent pre-pandemic. It's about inequalities and um, ineffective access to food in the different regions of the country. People not only lost their jobs, they didn't have access to food. About 100 people benefit monthly from the food being produced on this urban farm. An open kitchen is also available to anyone in the community. This urban farmer says growing vegetables at home and in communities is one solution to secure nutritious food. We've seen a lot of people coming here, you know, uh, wanting to, to harvest some, they don't have money. So we've seen a lot of people coming through and with the willingness of also working in the land because they see the results that they're going to eat at the end of the day. They're also teaching children how to grow vegetables and herbs, skills they can take home. With food prices having spiked nearly 7% this year, according to the government, these projects have become crucial to many. If more people can be involved, you know, in growing food, you know, taking care of vacant land and try to make it in a food forest, then we can have more food, more people that we can feed. Waiting for seeds to sprout is no quick fix. But with more funding, Makers Valley wants to plant more vegetable patches throughout the community to help put more greens on people's plates. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. On the next Straight Talk Africa, we're going to look at the Me Too effect on Africa's women. Sisterhood! Sisterhood! Hear my voice! Hear my voice! In recent years, the movement against sexual abuse and harassment has helped bring high-profile figures in Hollywood and global politics to book. To be a woman is not a crime! To be a woman is not a crime! But how global and inclusive is the Me Too movement? Is it helping or hurting the fight for women's rights and safety in African countries? We'll also look at the role and space for men in the conversation. So be sure to join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. And that is our show this week. A big thank you to all of my guests and a big thank you to you for always watching and always listening. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.